This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to those of you who are here and those worshiping with us online. Pastor Karen is taking a well-earned break this week by running a half marathon, and I'm very proud of her for doing it. She'll be back with us next Sunday. I do call your attention to all the announcements in your order of worship. They all deserve your consideration. I'll just lift up that this coming Tuesday night is Kids Against Hunger. If you haven't done that project with us yet, you are missing out. It is a lot of fun and an easy and sociable way to make a big difference fighting hunger, not only around the world, but right here in Delaware County and in the Philadelphia region. So please consider that. I know Lisa has some announcements for us as well. up and let everybody know that we only have two youth group sessions left in the year but we would love to have you come we are returned to in-person meetings so <clears throat> we're meeting in the Roland room we do have a lot of activities that we do outside pending the weather um, but being downstairs and sharing a meal together is always a wonderful time so please feel free to come out our next meeting is next Sunday um, it'll be May 1st and then we have our new invitational and our final meeting on um, May 15th, also in the Roland Room. So anybody who will be going from fifth grade into sixth grade is welcome. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Kristen Mitchell. We'll answer any questions you might have, but just keep that on your radar. Additionally, after... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, before that last new invitational meeting, we are taking a trip to Hershey Park. It is open to anyone, even if you are not directly involved with youth group or your youth has graduated out, or if you just wanna come by and, um, and hang out for the day, it's a great time. So please feel free to let us know. There is a link, um, or excuse me, not a link, um, but a QR code that you can actually take a picture of with your phone and it'll take you to the registration. If you are not as tech savvy as that, that is okay. Just give me a call in the church office and I will help you um, figure out what you need to do and give you some more information. Um, so just keep that on your radar. And then uh, since Mac is not here this morning, that is, um, I just wanted to raise everyone's attention to the Strawberry Festival coming up. It's going to be on June 3rd. It's a Friday night. So just keep that on your calendar. If you want to make something for the Strawberry Festival or um, one of the things that we are asking for is more jewelry for Ruth's famous jewelry table. So um, there is a little announcement in the bulletin as well. So take a look at that. We would love to have a few more items to put on the table. We've been selling them down quite a bit since the pop-up thrift shop. So if you have anything laying around that's still in really lovely condition and you just don't wear it very much, um, feel free to donate. Um, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks. Are there any other announcements we should make at this time? Then let's prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. Good morning. Please rise if you are able. I'm sorry. Excuse me on the place on there. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, now, rise if you are able, please, and join me in the call to worship from Psalm 150. Hallelujah, praise God in the holy temple. Give praise in the mighty vault of heaven. Praise, praise God, God whose acts are mighty. Give, give praise for God's exceeding greatness. Praise God with blasts of the ram's horn. Give praise with the lyre and harp. Praise, praise God, God with tambourines and dancing. Give praise with strings and flute. Praise God with clashing cymbals. 
Give praise with triumphant symbols. Let everything that breathes praise God. Hallelujah. Come, let us worship God. And now let us join together in singing the opening hymn, Crown Him with Many Thorns, which is in the back of your bulletin. Please remain standing and join me in the opening prayer. Living God, for whom no door is closed and to whom all hearts are open, grant we may see the risen Christ among us today and strengthen us to touch his wounds where they bleed in the lives of others. For the sake of him who died and was raised and who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So trusting not in ourselves, but in God's amazing grace, let us confess our sins, first using the prayer printed in the order of worship and then praying silently. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy upon us. Help us live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. When we were dead because of our sins, God, who is rich in mercy and out of great love for us, brought us to life together with Christ, raising us up with him and seating us with him in the heavenly places. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. By grace, we have been saved. Alleluia, alleluia. these words of the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In thanksgiving, let us return the offerings of our life and our labor to the Lord. If you're able, please rise as we pray the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Almighty God, we rejoice that death could not hold your son and that he calls us to follow him into new life with joy and gladness. By your spirit, lift us from disbelief and despair and set our feet in Christ's holy way that our lives may be signs of his life and that all we give and do may show his love.
may be seated. I see some youth with us, but no children. So our worship will continue as we sing together. We will walk by faith and not by sight. You may be seated. I mean it this time. <laughs> Let us pray. And so again, O oh God, we come before you daring to ask a miracle. For unless and until we read these words in dependence upon your spirit and in expectation of meeting you, they are simply ink on the page. Breathe fresh life into them in this time as we hear them and read them and speak them, that they may become for us a new and living word, drawing us ever closer to your word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Let all God's people say amen. This morning's first scripture lesson comes way back in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 2, verses, second half of verse 4 through 8. Listen for a word from the Lord. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb on the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and the water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ according to John. I will tell you a story of the first Easter evening from the 20th chapter. I invite you to watch and continue to listen for God's word. When it was evening that same day, the first day of the week, and the disciples were behind shut doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, 
Peace be with you. And after he'd said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, <laughs> they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, wasn't with them when Jesus came. The other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand in his side, I won't believe. Eight days later, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Then Jesus did many other signs in his disciples' presence, signs not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. The Holy Gospel of the Lord. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. A little over a week ago, I think I got a text message from Thomas. I don't mean it literally. Don't tell Karen, you can't let Mike preach again the next time you're gone. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more I thought this text I got sounded like one Thomas might have written if he'd had access to texting. On any one of those eight days when the other disciples were telling him, probably over and over telling him all week long, we've seen the Lord. The message was from a friend, and we'll go ahead and call him Tom. Why not? And it came just before the Easter holiday weekend. Spread the word, Tom wrote. He has risen. And then in parentheses, and if you happen to talk to him, tell him we really need him back here because we've got some stuff that's got to be straightened out. Now, maybe Tom didn't mean much of anything by his text. Maybe it was just some good-natured ribbing over the fact that he doesn't share my faith. But on the other hand, Maybe Tom's text was his way of telling me why this whole Easter business just doesn't click with him. I don't know what stuff he had in mind, but I can make some good guesses. And even though you don't know Tom, I'm sure you can too. Because there's no shortage of stuff that's wrong in our world and in our communities, and in our families, and in our relationships, and in our own lives. We're wounded people living in a wounded world. 
And if, as we proclaim, Christ is risen, and sin and evil and death are defeated, and we and the world are different, and in the words of the song Doug and Susan played for us, up from the grave he arose, then why is all that stuff still here and so painful? And what does he intend to do about it? So if you talk to him, if you happen to run into him, if you happen to see him, would you tell him we've got stuff? I think the Apostle Thomas could have been saying things like that. His issue isn't doubt, not really. He isn't wrestling with intellectual reservations about the veracity of the claims the disciples are making that Jesus is alive. He isn't an early adopter of the scientific method. He isn't a skeptic. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Healthy skepticism can come in handy. And critical thinking is a must for separating fact from opinion and what's true from what's false. And the scientific method and mindset, while not foolproof, are the best tools we have for understanding so much in this world. And having intellectual reservations about the veracity of a claim doesn't have to be the intellectual equivalent of crossing your fingers behind your back. Asking questions can be a mark of integrity and honesty. But doubting Thomas isn't the right name for this disciple. Try instead anxious Thomas or fearful Thomas or maybe even wounded Thomas. I think Thomas would like nothing more than to share his fellow disciples' joy. Just a few chapters before this story, Jesus announces he's going to go back to Judea, where the religious leaders have been actively plotting his death. But he's going to go back, despite the danger, to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead, which all the disciples see him do once they get there. But Thomas is the only one who says before they go, let us go with him that we may die with him. Thomas knows following Jesus can be risky, but he's willing to do it because he trusts this man. He loves this man. I think Thomas would love to share the joy these disciples feel. And he doesn't really ask for anything more than they got. All he wants to see is what they've seen. All he wants is to touch maybe what they've already touched. He wants, he craves that personal face-to-face meeting with Jesus. It's as though he's telling them, you've seen the Lord, great, I haven't. And where does that leave me? Unless I see, I won't believe. How can I? So if you happen to talk to him, if you happen to run into him behind closed doors again, if you happen to see him, please tell him, I really need him back here. We really need him back here to straighten some stuff out. New Testament scholars point out that in the Gospel of John, to believe has a very specific meaning. As one of them writes, in John, belief is a category of relationship. It's not about agreeing with the head. It's a category of relationship. Read through John's Gospel sometime and make a list of all the people who have direct personal encounters with Jesus. The list gets very long, very quickly. But those who come out of these encounters with a close and loving and continuing relationship with Jesus, just as he has a close and continuing and loving relationship with God, they are the ones who believe. Thomas isn't wrong to insist that he needs that personal encounter with Jesus to believe. 
where he needs help is understanding that sight, physical sight, is not required for that encounter and that relationship. He does ultimately have the chance to see what the other disciples saw and to touch maybe what they already touched. And like them, the important reality he sees is more than the fact that Jesus is somehow in the locked room with them. Because he says, my Lord and my God. He sees those wounded hands and that wounded side and knows that this is love poured out for him and for the world. And this is love that doesn't wash away the wounds and doesn't strip away the scars, but shares the suffering and helps us see suffering in a new light. Jesus' risen body still bears the marks of the choice he made to share our life, stuff and all. Jesus' risen body still bears the marks of the suffering he took on to take away the sin of the world, just as his father sent him to do. Thomas sees this as the other disciples have seen it. And now Thomas can be part of the response, that joy-filled, ongoing relationship with Christ in which this new community is sent out just as Christ was sent. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit over his disciples, bringing them to new life as surely as God breathed the first human to life back in Eden. Jesus strengthens and sends his community into the world to be his living and loving presence for others. And the good news for us who cannot see Jesus in the flesh as those disciples did, who cannot touch his physical wounds as those disciples had the chance to do, the good news is we can still have that personal encounter that leads to belief that leads to ongoing relationship. Jesus is not present to our physical senses, but we can still sense him. Maybe sometimes only faintly or fleetingly, maybe sometimes more powerfully. But we are here this morning or watching online because at some point or points in our lives, we have somehow glimpsed him at least, We have somehow run into him through others in some way. We have somehow heard him. And it has been enough. It's been enough to at least start that relationship. It's been enough to at least keep us going through our wounds and through our suffering. It's been enough to fill us with some measure of hope and peace and joy. And it's been enough to send us out to see Christ's wounds in the world around us and to respond. Have you been to the Effort of Cloisters in Lancaster? Nobody? Oh, okay, good. Somebody. A few. A few. Go sometime. It's a fascinating place. And when I first went, I was so struck by what I thought were the wild beliefs these Christian mystics who lived there 300 years ago had. Certainly their worship life was brutal. They slept on long, narrow, hard wooden benches, and they got up every night at midnight for hours-long vigils of praying and singing as they waited for Jesus to come back. I wouldn't want to do that. But what keeps me from writing them off as weirdos is what I heard about how they tended to some 500 of General Washington's men after the Battle of Brandywine. They nursed so many of those soldiers back to health, but at the cost of disease and infection that led to their own deaths and that hastened the death of their community. One soldier who survived wrote this, 
until I entered the walls of Ephrata, I had no idea of pure and practical Christianity. Not that I was ignorant of the forms or even the doctrines of religion. I knew it in theory before. I saw it in practice then. I knew it in theory before. I saw it in practice then. Forms, doctrines, theory, they all have their value. They all have their place. But what wounded people want and what this wounded world needs, even if they can't name it, are pure and practical and personal encounters with the wounded and living Jesus Christ. And because he no longer walks this earth, that means those encounters are going to come through the likes of you and me, the people on whom he breathes the Holy Spirit and sends out to be his presence in the world today. We, as his church, can show our wounds and witness to however we have seen the Lord and tell how he has healed or is even now healing us and then reach out in his name to touch and heal the wounds of others. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you are able, please rise as together we affirm the faith of our baptism using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Are there particular joys or concerns to lift up in prayer this morning? Yes, Barb. I'm sorry to hear your mother's cousin passed away, you say, and what was your, the cousin's name? Kim. Kim. So prayers for the Zalonka family. Yes, Seth. Seth's aunt Elsa having brain surgery this week and his coworker Tom recovering from a fall. Yes. Joey. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. 16. Wow. Big milestone. <laughs> Are there any? Yeah, Lisa. Yes, there's uh, a wonderful joy. Um, Kim Wooden actually just finished her clinical, her final clinical, and was graduating on uh, May 7th. I think is the actual date. Um, so this last week is finishing up final projects, but she is in the home stretch to be totally done with years and years of education. So. <laughs> Oh, that's fabulous. It's a wonderful joy just, um, continue to lift her up and love her this year. Kim Wooden finishing up her clinical uh, education in physical therapy, and she's going to graduate, and they already are fighting over her in the job market. So that's fantastic. Any other joys or concerns? Then let us pray. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in his name. 
Confident in your love and mercy, we bring our prayers to you. Guide the rulers of the nations, God Most High. Move them to set aside fear, greed, and vain ambition, and bow to your sovereign rule. We pray for peace in Ukraine and in all war-torn regions, that you would quickly bring the day when all people may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Renew our nation in ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Bless all who live, work, study, and play in the cities of Philadelphia and Chester, here in Marple Township and in all surrounding communities. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from crime and violence. Inspire and strengthen us to seek the welfare of the places we live and the common good of all. Restore among us a love of the earth you created for our home. Give us respect for all your creatures, that living in harmony with everything you have made, your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Make the sick and injured whole, especially Elsa and Tom, Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn, especially those mourning Kim. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you. We give you thanks for the joys of this life, for birthdays and graduations and accomplishments and achievements to celebrate with each other. And we pray that you would strengthen this congregation in our work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love that our voices may speak your praise. And in all the things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join together as we sing our closing hymn, When in our music God is glorified. Sing a song that night. 